we're going to deal with, if I had to subtitle today, it would be, it's time for a confrontation. So not just no more masks, but it's time for a confrontation. And we looked at and examined that here, I'll give you kind of basic and you'll get the illustration. In life, we're formed by what's called mirroring. And mirroring is really empathetic responses in our life. For instance, if you were hungry as a child and your parent was very self-absorbed or not that they were, we all have, let me, let me set you free, everybody's got issues. Look at your neighbor, say, Pastor Paul is talking to you right now, or I mean the person behind you. Say, she's talking to the person behind you. Your, your friend has issues. <laughs> so um, we all, all of our parents had issues. It's just to the degree of what issues. So we're going to become more whole so we don't keep passing all that stuff down and we're going to break some cycles. But mirroring is this, that whatever the empathetic responses were is what got put into me and it formed me. So that was through primarily my parents, my caretakers, life events, etc. So when that happened as a child, say I was hungry and my mom was self-absorbed or she was, you know, doing whatever or not attempting. So instead of saying, I realize or acknowledge you're hungry but she said oh it made me feel as if I wasn't really hungry and ignored that because you know she wanted to keep driving for three hours or whatever and didn't pull over let me go to the back in other words she didn't acknowledge my needs with needs with an empathetic response there was a disconnect that develops in you that from reality to a false sense that tells you, well, you're not really hungry, something's wrong with you. So from the most minor little things down to more major things, that, or if there's a death or loss or any serious thing. So what happens in life is because we're born, we're conceived in iniquity, right? We're born into sin, missing the character of God. Then we get this distortion and this perception. So we get falsely labeled because we let events and experiences define us people's expectations and opinions, their mirroring. So their empathetic response begins to develop me and form me, that's called mirroring, and then I project. And project is a defense mechanism when I'm not really emotionally equipped or can handle things. And so what I do is instead of taking ownership, because I'm not even sure how to locate what all is going on, I take my responsibility and put it on other people. It's called projection. That's why when usually people are accusing you of something, they're revealing what their issue is. You're so selfish. <laughs> they're revealing themselves. So where do we want to go in this? Here's where we're going to go. Every dark area in your life, every, I don't care if it's like midnight, as dark as dark can be, or if it's just a speck of darkness, we are putting our faith that you're going to have word and the spirit of God that after October 31st, no more mask. That you're not going to have to live a false appearance. That's what a hypocrite is. A living a false appearance, being one thing, a pretender in front of everybody. Come on, when you really have some inner turmoil and I can't be real with you because I'm not safe. Because I'm a spirit who struggles with humanity. Oh, look at your neighbor say, she's talking to the person behind you again. So... <laughs> So we're going to go from this to over here, which what is this? James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25 says the word of God is a mirror and it reflects the truth to you. And so anybody who walks by sees themselves in the word, but walks away from it, you know, and you don't really, then you really are deceiving yourself and destroying yourself. But if you catch a glimpse and you keep the word in you, it begins to transform you that all the distorted images are left in my life and I become a reflection of who I really am because I can see clearly through what God has to say about me, what God has to say to me, and what God says I can do, what God says I can be, and what God says I am. So that's where we're getting to clarity, where life comes into focus. So are you ready to deal with some things? Strap on your seatbelt. You're going to stay seated today. Look at your neighbor. Slap them a high five. Say, I'm going to help you out during this service. Say, say I'm going to help you out. Make sure that they've got the ability to praise. And you're ready? Say, bring it on, Pastor Paula. Okay, go with me over to 2 Samuel there, and we're going to look at, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we're going to get some help from one of my friends, Miss Hannah, today. But before we do, we have been in our primary text, which is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. The message version says this, we refuse to wear masks and play games. We don't maneuver and manipulate behind the scenes. We don't twist God's word to suit ourselves. What he's saying is we're not perfect, but we are real. It's 
it's time that the church really get to the place of authenticity if we don't embrace who we really are that we are a spirit and that we struggle with human experiences but the church is not a museum for saints it is a hospital for sinners I asked them on Facebook yesterday if you have to define yourself help me out or label yourself what would you call yourself it was quite interesting how people reflect or call themselves for the different things because my word is I'm redeemed that's it I am I'm a work in progress that has been redeemed it's the blood of Jesus Christ it's the promise of God that I every day I want to look more like God act more like God think more like God talk more like God create more like God that is a continual process in my life look at somebody say don't mess with me because God's not through with me yet tell them say so so when we get that authentic living then we are in a place of purpose and production which is fulfillment but you cannot even begin to live authentically until you first get to a place of confrontation and the problem is many of us live in denial you can't conquer what you don't confront and you can't you can't identify what you don't confront so without confrontation I'll never be able to see who I really am now to confront means to come face to face with I know we like to confront everybody else we like to confront our spouse confront the church members confront the government confront the system but sometimes you just need to confront yourself you need to have a I call it a come to Jesus meeting you know how you have a come to Jesus meeting with everybody and all the issues sometimes you need your own come to Jesus meeting that you look at yourself and say now let's get real girl there's some issues here and if you really want to be what God has said and do what God says then you've got to face some things in order to do that I have to take off the mask because a mask is something that disguises me that conceals me we're afraid to reveal ourselves. but there's a woman that really helped me out I love this lady she's in the Bible in the Old Testament and this is a woman that went to church she was a godly woman she was praying she served the Lord I mean she loves her family she loves her husband she had all what we would think of the virtuous ingredients she was sacrificing all the time she was serving God she was praying she was going to church and yet she looked right on the outside but she was all jacked up on the inside I mean she had some can I talk to you like Pastor Paula would can we just plow there she had some inner turmoil she was a bomb waiting to explode and detonate because don't we agree that most of the decisive battles we fight in life are inward that the problems are not really external issues they're inward issues and so that's where the turbulent Jesus said where do all these wars and where do all these adulteries and things come from they're not from the outside they're from the inside so the things that we face externally are from what we're struggling with in internally so let's look to Hannah she's gonna help us out first Samuel chapter 1 it's gonna be up on the screens let's read it corporately and in concert in the amplified let me hear you now I need some boldness do you need to stand up or are you good sit down because we're gonna read a lot you ready say I'm ready pastor Paula okay you can be seated because we're gonna read a lot but let me hear you now these aren't names like Jack Joey and John so we'll we'll fudge our way through verse 1 ready there was a certain man, or Mothbaim Zophim, yes, Pastor Mike will get that one right, of the hill country of Ephraim, named Elkanah, son of Jeroam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu. Who names her kid Tohu? The son of Zuf and Ephraimite. Thank you, Lord. Verse 2. Oh, it gets interesting now, guys. He had two wives. We got a situation in the house. All right, he had two wives, one named Hannah and the other named Penina. Come on, y'all know, some of you can't handle the one you've got. He had two wives. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Verse 3, this man went from his city year by year to worship and to sacrifice the Lord of hosts of Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were the Lord's priests. And when the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give to Penina his wife and all her sons and daughters portion of the sacrificed meat. Let me hear you, verse 5. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion, for he loved Hannah. But, this is the key, look at this, the Lord had given her no children. Verse 6. This embarrassed and grieved Hannah. I love this because she's got an issue and she wants to blame everybody else, but it's going to be hard when she has 
has to face off against God because God's not going to do everything that we order and ask and say because he knows some things need to be worked out in our life before he just gives us every little petition and request that we're seeking him for. So God shuts up her womb. Uh-oh, <laughs> don't tell me that, Pastor Paula. And it embarrasses and grieves her. And her rival provoked her greatly to vex her because the Lord had left her childless. Verse 7, let me hear you. So it was year after year whenever Hannah went up to the Lord's house that Penina provoked her. So she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Girl, what's wrong with you? He said, Hannah, why are you crying? And why do you not eat? And why are you grieving? Am I not more to you than ten sons? So Hannah rose after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh. And now Eli the priest was sitting on his seat beside a post of the temple tent of the Lord. And Hannah was in distress of soul, praying to the Lord, read it loud, and weeping, what? Bitterly. She vowed, saying, okay, God, I'm going to make you a deal. I just can't live like this anymore. Lord, if you will indeed look on my affliction of your handmaiden and earnestly remember and not forget your handmaiden, but give me a son I'll give him to the Lord all his life and no razor shall touch his head and as she continued verse 12 praying before the Lord Eli the pastor noticed her mouth Hannah was speaking in her heart only her lips moved but her voice was not heard so Eli thought she was drunk oh this is getting even better by the by the verse so now the pastor who I'm sure has got some projection issues because his sons are definitely all messed up and got their own issues now he says you're drunk <laughs> you, you, what you've been drinking or smoking or doing and Eli said to her how long he judges her will you be intoxicated put that wine away from you isn't that how and that's the very thing if I could just stop right there that I despise about religion that's the very thing because it's making a judgment on someone never even understanding them having an empathetic response but I'm gonna label you you're drunk and you know if other church members would have been around the whole town would have called her a drunkard and she would have never been set free from that that kind of implant and that imprint on her and, and so she's and now she's not safe because you misjudge me you don't know me you're making this um, this this conclusion about me and you think you know what's wrong and something is wrong but it's not what you're making wrong so she's dealing with all these things here and she says but and here's the breakthrough verse 15 but Hannah answered she said no pastor listen to me no my Lord I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit I haven't drunk neither wine nor strong drink but I was pouring out my soul before the Lord I was so toxic it made it look like I had had some Patron and Jack Daniels and a mojito why do y'all think I don't know what y'all had before okay <laughs> I was so messed up. I had some, what's it called? Dunes, what's that stuff, y'all? That dollar stuff? Well, you pass the mic going, I don't know, okay. <laughs> but I was pouring out my soul before, y'all know what it is, <laughs> before the Lord, verse 16. Regard not your handmaiden as a wicked woman, for out of my great complaint and bitter provocation, she said, I'm hurt, I'm messed up. There's some bitterness in me. I've been speaking. And then Eli said, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant your petition which you've asked of him. And Hannah said, let your handmaiden find grace in your sight. So she went away and ate, and her countenance no longer sad. And the family rose early the next morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned to their home in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. Hey, y'all, that's not like I know you. That's like I know you. <laughs> that's like put on Victoria's Secret and let's get this party started. It's not like I know you. Come on. It's in the Bible, God. This is awesome. No, Elkanah knew her. And the Lord remembered her. And Hannah became pregnant. And in due time bore a son. And named him Samuel. Heard of God because she said, I've asked him of the Lord. And they go on in chapter 2. is so significant because you see a whole transformation. And here's what I believe is going to happen in your life. As you get the true image of who you are. Because chapter 2 is like a distinct 
distinctly different woman she starts out and says Hannah prayed now she's praying again and it's not oh looking like she's drunk watch what she's praying now second prayer we hear from her my heart exalts and triumphs in the Lord my horn my strength is lifted up in the Lord my mouth is no longer silent for it is open wide over my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation there's none holy like the Lord there's none beside you there is no rock like our God talk no more so very proudly let not arrogance go forth from your mouth for the Lord is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed the bows of the mighty are broken and those who stumbled with girded with strength those who are full have hired themselves out for bread but those who are hungry have ceased to hunger the barren has born seven look what the Lord has done but she who has many children languishes and is forlorn the Lord slays and makes alive he brings down to Sheol and he raises up the Lord makes poor and makes rich he brings low and he lifts up he raises up the poor out of the dust hill and he sets them before the princes even the princes of his people I will praise the Lord I'll bless him at all times he'll guard the feet of the godly she says he's gonna watch over you he's got you but the wicked shall be silenced and perish in darkness for by strength shall no man prevail these adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces against them will he thunder in heaven because my God is a bad God he's an awesome God he's a good God she goes off and she has a purity and a power that is not pretentious because you can't come into here and be something that you're not out there so this time when she goes off in the house of God it's for real because she doesn't have the junk in her she doesn't have all the contamination don't we want to get to the place that we have real power don't we want to get to the place that we don't have to work ourselves all up and because it doesn't take all that you know that we we I want the authenticity a real power in a real relationship with a real God who understands even though I'm spirit I struggle my humanity look to somebody say you are gonna get some help today say but you've got to confront some things say I'm sorry your neighbor behind you has to confront their issues look at them slap them a high five say are you ready for a face off are you ready for a face off look at two people say it's time to face off come on say it's time to face it all right let's look at her life there's so much richness and depth to glean in this text there's so much treasures that we could begin to excavate and we could really examine to get to the truth but Hannah's vulnerability proves to be valuable in our life it proves to help us in our walk with God and in adjusting and having a course correction in our attitude and in our healing and ultimately in our breakthrough she will help you and help me get to that desired place of authenticity through her transparency Hannah just opens up and she unveils herself and in her realness she becomes a role model for you and for me of how to pave the path to get from the inner turmoil to the place of peace and pleasure she, she takes us through that transparency transparency to the place of peace and wholeness and completeness and contentment and really abundant life that is found in Christ and defined by a strong sense of personal identity because without a sense of self without a sense of what my nature and direction is then I'm gonna be lost if the enemy wants to mess you up he comes and excuse your spiritual perception so he can rob your destiny because if he can get you to doubt who you are and who you are then he can take a part of your destiny because you have no real identity you don't know who you belong to you don't know what your formation is and so without that you cannot realize your individualization your separateness from others and from things and you become enmeshed enmeshed is when you develop an unhealthy dependence on other people or things for a sense of self so you begin to define yourself by externals by labels by associations by things by events and experiences but you are not the car that you drive 
You are not the house that you live in. You are not the title that is over your desk. You are not the person that you're married to. You're not the church that you attend. You cannot be defined by something external. You're not the money that you have or don't have. You are a child of God in the image of God, made in his likeness, formed in his fashion with the resemblance of God, which means you are powerful from the inside out and your true essence is spirit that is wrapped in a body and has a soul that is a mind, will, and emotion emotions so you will lose yourself when you get enmeshed you lose yourself in trying to live according to other people's expectations other people's opinions other people's preferences and choices and all of us to some point have lost a part of ourself in other people we know that statistically 87 percent of people wake up miserable every day they don't like their jobs they don't feel like they're living in purpose they're not happy about their life they're not content no matter what their situation is and so they don't like what they're doing they don't like the whole life that they're living well that devil is a liar and so often uh, when we find ourselves or try to look for our, ourselves by other people's expectations or opinions or decisions or choices is to the point that we lose who we truly are and we no longer know what it is that I like what it is that I desire what it is that I dreamed of because so much has been put on us that we got lost or maybe you never even discovered ourselves. but Hannah helped me she really sincerely did and I believe that she's gonna help you out too because a sister can help you out today she helped me because in her vulnerability she shows me first off you have to surrender she surrenders she lets down the defenses she so shows me it's okay to unveil it's okay that you don't have to live this guarded life all the time and not let anyone see your humanity that you don't have to have fortresses built up so high that you're gonna go through process in life she lets the defenses off she takes off the false and she just gets real she takes everything and she unveils herself because being real is not always easy to do especially in the church can I bring it on home right now this should be the safest place it should be a refuge but being real is not easy because if you're real your mind tells you through either personal experiences or what you've seen with other people if I'm real then I'm gonna get hurt if I'm real it's too dangerous it's not safe for me if I'm real I'll be rejected I won't be accepted I'll be made to feel worthless but can you see my nakedness and I not be ashamed can you show me it's like this if I see into you then you can see into me so I'm so glad that Hannah unveils her life I'm grateful that she shares her secrets she shows me her humanity she shows me her struggles her insecurity she shows me that a good woman let's take it even a step further because she's beyond a good woman Sheila she's a God woman she shows me that a God woman that a person that truly loves God she she loves the Lord goes to church prays sacrifices serves that a good woman can get a really bad attitude that a good woman can get a nastiness on the inside of her that a God woman she shows me that, that I can be right on the outside but really jacked up on the inside I'm glad about this because she shows me a good woman can have a bad problem and get a sick soul from an injury in life I'm glad that she's willing to let me see behind the veil it's just a side note and a thought but maybe that's why Revelation chapter 12 verse 11 says they overcame him meaning the devil by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony the Greek word word literally means the evidence given it means the report it means the record if I never show you where God brought me from or some of the weaknesses that we struggle then you think that I'm some super saint come on you think the person next to you and that's the problem because then you begin to compare your life and measure it up against the other people that you're going to church with and you think well what's wrong with me if they have this such a perfect thing and every prayer gets answered and breakthrough always comes and picture perfect family but the reality is maybe this is working but this is falling apart 
It's called life. There, life gives you different things, different seasons, and you face different dilemmas. And that's why we have faith. That's why we have a Savior that in, his, in our weakness, his strength is made perfect. Because it is by grace that I'm saved. And it is his mercy that forms me. But it is his word that frames me and fits me for life. I'm grateful for his grace. I'm thankful for his mercy working every day. And I am absolutely ecstatic about the Word of God that can change me from glory to glory to glory to glory so it's when other people begin to open up and begin to show us and expose some of their frailties and weaknesses and how they overcame because if God did it for one God will do it for another I'm glad not everybody testifies I got a breakthrough overnight because some things have taken me years <laughs> I'm glad that I get real testimony you know this says hey listen and I had to patiently endure and, and walk in the light of God's word in some dark hours but God was faithful and he did come through and here's what God can and here's what God will do because I'm like yeah I can identify to that I get it so Hannah shows me that year after year this wasn't just a day struggle Pastor Fred she had some issues because all of us do that if we'll get real we've been carrying some baggage for some years we've been carrying things from our early childhood that are just that are still affecting our adulthood we just keep reenacting trying to fix in our adulthood what didn't happen in our childhood or what was neglected or what went wrong that's why you've got to be here on those Thursdays so she helps me get beyond the barrier to take off the mask by confronting or coming face to face with herself a barrier is an obstacle that's in the way and that's the real problem we have some obstacles that are in the way look at your neighbor say I know you've got some barriers say say or that person behind you's got some barriers say but help is on the way slap them a high five say helps on the way so a barrier is an obstacle right an obstruction it is a limit or a boundary Christ did not create you to be limited there are no limitations except the ones you place on yourself so how do I get out of these boundaries how do I get out of these restrictions how do I get out of this narrow-minded because a stronghold is a mindset that is resistant to change how do I see life differently when all I've ever known is this one perspective or worldview that was mirrored in me and now I'm projecting it and I keep creating Creating the sixth cycle I don't want to play church I want to be the church help me pastor Paula take off this mask and be true to the core and the essence of who I really am I don't know the barrier in your life and it's really not that important at this point to identify the barrier because barriers create states of confusion of nature and direction that's a that's an identity crisis that's what that is and it creates ultimately a false image that I live behind this illusion and I don't know if the barrier was you were physically or sexually or mentally or verbally abused and these are these are terms that we don't like to look at neglect and abuse and abandon but the reality is all of us had some and that's why I break those down on Thursdays all of us had some kind of neglectfulness some kind of things that were not nurtured properly not because our caretakers were bad people it's because they were not nurtured properly so you just keep passing down because when you know better you live better and let's face it guys let's get real we've only come forth with issues in the last few decades because our forefathers they surely didn't talk about things they just push it behind listen you got pregnant out of wedlock, like you got shipped away when my mom was a teenager that's why this how they did this how they handled then at least we're coming to the forefront and we're still all messed up and acting like oh no come on guys let's get real I was sitting back there frustrated because they were showing me I was showing when them we were the Osteens and behind me was Dr. Ray he was there from 9021 and we were laughing about the plastic surgery and all that and I said so he's looking at everybody and he told, said he'd operated on 30,000 people and we were laughing about it in the back and they, we talked about this one girl and they said to me oh yeah she's had all this surgery and that's all airbrush I said no no come on how can you not be jacked up when everything that you see is not even usually an image of what is real so you're trying to match yourself up to something that is pretty much non-existent and doesn't even have any sense of reality oh please don't make me go into there and and, and so we we hide things we live behind pretenses um, we have inner struggles that we're afraid to unveil and open up and we're not even sure if we want to see them ourselves because we're
we're not used to dealing with the emotions that feel overwhelming because we've been so programmed now that I gotta be happy I gotta be happy I gotta be happy happy is a good thing but guess what part of the process of getting to a place of real joy is going through some pain so to get a real contentment you're gonna cry some too you're gonna go through some so to have an appreciation of what's left in your life that means you've experienced some loss in your life so that's reality that is our reality and we don't know how to deal with reality because I know when somebody goes through a tragedy most people don't even reach out to them because they don't know what to say don't know what to do sometimes you say I don't know what to say I don't know what to do but I'm here for you if you need me I just want you to know that and don't say something stupid can I get real 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 with you don't tell me this is this is what makes people mad well the Lord take it and the Lord give it away I don't want to hear that I don't want to hear that when my daughters die don't tell me that come on that, that you have you, I don't know if you've been through that I don't want to hear that <laughs> I know he's sovereign I get life I'm gonna figure all that out but just you know you don't have to come up with an answer just I don't have an answer but I love you and he loves you and I'm gonna walk by your side so if you want to cry if you want to dump if you want to shout whatever you want to do I'm here for you I got you girl just go and that's what we need we need realness because you, you can't not everybody can handle don't just give them an answer right there because you just there's got to be a process to get that you know I'll get to the place that I can reconcile some of the things and the the, the, the mysteries the Bible said and the things that aren't revealed to men are the secrets of the Lord we're never gonna see those anything anyway so some things are just to remain kind of mysterious to us you'll never be able to analyze it or understand it all so sometimes it's not a matter of give me an answer it's just a matter of <laughs> just love me just walk through walk through life with me just walk through life with me don't try to fix me God's gonna fix me I'm gonna confront myself just love me unconditionally just help a girl out help a guy out slap somebody high five say let's get real let's get real so I don't know the place whether you were abandoned or neglected or rejected or smothered maybe you had excessive or unreasonable demands placed beyond your capabilities as a child or perhaps it's a fear of failure that creates this perfectionism maybe it was a death or a loss or critical parents or maybe you went through a divorce and your spouse was unfaithful and now there's this thing in you that says something's wrong with me I don't know what the barrier was but this I do know by the grace and the goodness of God we're gonna be able to face some things that have been plaguing us and until you confront it you can't conquer it so somebody say I'm ready I'm ready how many of you ready because I know how far I'm pushed say bring it all the way in okay say bring it in so when you, when you go beyond the barrier by confronting those things is really when you begin to have authentic living and Hannah lived in a culture where she was expected to have children she was expected to perform it's called people expectations and this creates a problem for all of us because when we're given powerful message whether they're spoken or unspoken that we only have value if we perform to others expectations that our value is defined by either what we do or who we are to your eyes or how we measure up and it develops this performance for acceptance so I have to be this or do this to be accepted or loved pressure affects us as people pressure come on if I produce if I I do right if I look right if I work enough then I'm okay then I'm loved then I'm valued it affected her womanhood that is the way she felt about herself as a person her esteem her overall judgment of herself and when we often allow what we do or what people think we should do to define us it begins to mess with our sense of self if she was a real woman after all she would produce children because historically and culturally in Hannah's lifespan you proved your womanhood by having children it consummated your relationship it secured your position so the more children you had the more of a woman you were but we would like to think with all of the modern technology with all the advancement with all of the education we've changed but thousands of years later guess what guys we really haven't changed that much because we still as a society and culture and especially in the church can I rip out can I hit some things we put pressure that is ridiculous 
on people. We put pressure. And, and I shouldn't be pressuring you. I shouldn't be pushing you like this. I should be pulling you into the good things of God. There should be a leading. There shouldn't be this pressure on you all the time. And our pressure might not be having children, which is what defines, but, but our pressure is, okay, I don't just have to have children. I've got to be an alpha woman. I've got to be a certain way, look a certain way, make so much money, go home, go out, make the bacon, come home fried up in the pan. And then y'all know after you take care of the kids and you do this and you do that, you gotta, you gotta make sure that you can put that negligee on at nine o'clock too and act. Come on, like, like you just, oh, you got so much energy. Baby, you like this, you're, you're dropping and everything. And you better have three degrees and you better live in such and such kind of house. I know no pressure on you at all. And beside that, if a demand gets put on you, after all, you are a Christian. You better know how to quote at least 50 scriptures. Know their Bible verses too. Or you really aren't saved. And then you've got to know all the different things and break down doctrinally and theologically. And by the way, did you pray your hour yet today? I mean, you better have had your hour of power. Come on. <laughs> because if you didn't have your hour of power, then we know. And God forbid, especially in the church, don't let me see your children are all messed up. Don't let me see they're strung out on drugs. Or, oh my God, they had a sexual encounter outside of marriage. What's wrong with you as a parent? You must have really messed up. You did something wrong. If you would have and out of out out. And then, oh, please, don't go to, I, I don't want to see you picture perfect family. I know, because after all, you should not, unless you da 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 da, and your household's in order, how can you da 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 da, and how can you da 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 and how can you da 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 and my, my, and you gotta be the bishop of one wife you know what that's saying being monogamous it's saying don't have don't be a polygamist <laughs> it's not saying that you haven't gone through a divorce it's saying you don't have a wife and then another one down the corner and another one over there which y'all know y'all playing that game too come on don't make me get into your stuff and maybe you aren't sexually with her but you're emotionally with her please I'm gonna get in your stuff if you keep looking at me like that you're giving her your emotions. You're giving her your energy. But I'm not sexually involved. Give me a break. Let's get real, guys. We gotta get real with this stuff. We gotta face that, that we, we've got some issues. Look at your neighbor say, the person behind you has issues. <laughs> And we can't deal with them because we're too afraid to because where am I going to get real? And if we can't get real in the house of God, then we don't have any help. If we can't get real in the house of God, then there's no help for us. But God, help us. Help us be a true, authentic people that love you. And even though we've been misformed and messed up, we don't want to stay misformed and all messed up. So we want true transformation. But how can I get to it? Because it's not going to happen. I'm not going to just lay hands on you and you'll be delivered. I'm telling you, and if that happened, I've already told you, it'd come back seven times stronger. You've got to do the work. I'm going to give you the toolbox, but you've got to say, I'm willing to work this word and this word work in me, and I'm not looking for a quick fix, but I'm looking for a lifelong journey because I'm in covenant and commitment with God, and I'm going to be changed, and you're not going to define me by a day, by a year, by a month, by a season, by an action, by an event. you got to wait till I'm all said and done, and when I say it's finished and I'm all poured out let's see what happens at the end of this thing because I'm gonna finish my course which is and even though I get a little derailed or bumpy I'm gonna finish this thing with the grace of God and the goodness of him I am and, and what how dare us start judging everybody else as we're picking a speck I mean, I'm picking a little splinter out of your eye and I've got a telephone pole protruding from mine. Stop dealing with your brother's speck when you've got a, a major log coming out of yours. You say, this wrong with you, this wrong with you. No, it's wrong with you because you are projecting what you see in them by what was mirrored in you. Oh, slap your neighbor a high five and say, it's, your, it's the person behind you she's talking to. So, so we have pressure.
pressure expectations from people pressure to be and to do and to have and that's why it's critical for us to know who we are Colossians 2 10 and you be, are complete in him Ephesians 1 4 he had chosen you before the foundations of the earth see that's so therapeutic to me pastor because God chose me before he chose me prior to any decision I'd made anything I'd done and he still marked me out he still loved me he still accepted me he doesn't like everything I've done come on and he has a way of course correcting he has a way uh, of bringing the right uh, uh, repentance and course correction and you can do that the easy way or the hard way but he loves me he loves me you have to know that that God loves you with an everlasting love that he's a good God not a punitive God he's not out to get you he's out to help you somebody slap your neighbor say help a person out give me a break so until you fully understand and receive that by faith you live in this falsity of pretense under this pressure to perform and what made it worse for Hannah is Penina is having baby after baby because some people succeeding is just simply rubbing the salt in the wound of your failure so you feel like your success is just a is a is a reminder to me of my failure now Penina is simply walking out the blessing of God on her life verse 6 is crucial here now I'm this is gonna be hard this is the thing that some of you are still in the shock mode right now you can't fully digest because <laughs> you never really looked inwardly but this one gets really hard but those of you who are half open do I have a church open and ready to receive all right here's the really hard time because it's okay if we get real with each other and say okay we're flawed but here's the part that oh this one's gonna be hard to digest ready verse 6 says Hannah was embarrassed and she was grieved right it shows the condition of her soul and, and, and she's because she's measured herself up against someone else and she, she's found her value as a reflection by comparing herself to someone else but it says in verse 5 and 6 which is critical that it was not Penina's issue Penina is just walking out the blessing of the Lord but it was the Lord who had shut up her womb Ooh. oh wow but God knows some things that you need to know and that is that if you are bitter and you get pregnant your fruit will be contaminated with the seed that you carry so he loves you too much and, and and she's mad and she's resentful because she doesn't see this thing as a blessing she sees it as why isn't life working for me so instead of seeing it like hey why don't I have my breakthrough some of you are like why didn't I start the business yet it's not fair but the reality is if you had them the financial pressure and the responsibilities and the things you couldn't handle it you would have had a nervous breakdown and God's preparing you you'll get it but you're gonna get it in his timing you'll get it some of you say well why have my Boaz come in because he that finds a wife finds a good thing I don't need to say anymore I'm still a work in progress obviously <laughs> but I'm on my way to a good thing somebody help me out oh some of y'all know you aren't living in a real marriage anyway it's just a pretentious thing I better get back to my preaching I'm gonna get real though all right pastor Michael stay focused okay so um anyway we're talking about covenant that God joins together that's why I said that Ooh, all my single people better hear me out so some people in life they just they resent you they hate you because they think that you won and they didn't and it's really not your issue but it's just and that doesn't mean you should be getting in their game because you'll lose what you have if you luster yourself and don't have an empathetic response it's not they don't see that you have struggles too that you have issues too it's just there's so much wounding and hurt that they can't see beyond that so they see you won and they resent the fact that life is working for you apparently and it's not for them life doesn't seem to be fair and when I take on that perception I get this attitude that the world's not safe and that people are not safe and you don't mean to be mad can we get real you don't mean to be mad I don't mean to be envious it's just 
Why do you have it and I don't? Why did your dream work out and mine didn't? Can we take some mask off? Because Hannah doesn't understand why. Why isn't it working for me? Penina, on the other hand, did nothing wrong. She's just simply having babies. But it got on Hannah's nerves because she had the wrong attitude. Because she doesn't get, I go to church, I love God, I tithe, but why isn't it working for me? Why are things falling apart in my life? And you have to be careful. Let me flip this for a minute. You have to be careful of people who walk among you and are secretly not glad for you. You have to be careful. I'm going to teach you something here. Because it's really birthed out of their own insecurities and their own fears. And they're not a safe person. Because if they do not have a confrontation with them, themselves and their own issues and take ownership of that, ultimately they'll sabotage your life. And when they start to sabotage your life, they'll make you feel guilty for what's good in your life. And if you take on that, just like that's what Elkanah started going through. He's like, why am I not enough? What's wrong with you? I'm giving you a double portion. And he's feeling frustrated because he feels he can't fix her. Why can't I make you happy? But it's not his issue. It's her issue. But if he takes that on, he feels responsible. He feels like, well, if I was really a man, now we've got all the sick dysfunction going on. And so now this guilt comes on. And if I get guilty, then I'm going to take on shame. And if I feel shameful, then I'm going to lose the good thing that I do have in my life because I'm going to push it away. And so it creates this whole six cycle. And verse five and six, as I said, revealed something so telltale. The Lord left her childless because God knew something needed to be done in her before it could be done through her. And therefore, there are some things that are shut up off in your life for your benefit because a bitter woman produces a bitter child and will bring forth a bitter life. Hannah was a good woman. She's good. She's a God woman. But she had resentment. She had anger. She had inner turmoil. She had confusion. She didn't have a strong sense of self and identity. And so when things on the outside didn't work, it confused her on the inside of who she really was. Why is it not working? And so this good woman gets a bad attitude, which creates a barrier, and she's frustrated. Frustration affects you. It, it begins to come out of you. It started to affect her relationship with her husband. It started to affect her relationship with herself. Eventually everything. Like I said, Elkanah says, hey, why can't I fix you? Why aren't you happy? Why is what I'm doing for you not enough? She's so frustrated and so out of control in her soul that she's about to mess up the one good thing that she does have. She's about to mess all that up. Nobody wants to derail their life. But a personal storm begins to affect Hannah. And here's the breaking point. Can I get us there quickly? Here it is. Because here's the breaking point. Sometimes the worst thing that happens in your life becomes the best thing for you. It becomes the best thing. Because it forces you to deep introspection. It forces you to a confrontation. And finally, when she's willing to confront, watch what happens. She goes off and she starts to explode on the altar. I mean, she just starts going crazy. She freaks out. She explodes. She goes ballistic on God. And God can handle it. She starts just letting all this bitterness out. And God understands when we act like a fool. God understands. That's why he says, stop putting on a false appearance. I want the real you. I know the real you. And you see, not everybody is at the altar praising. Some people are exploding. And he can see your wickedness and not condemn you. He can see your weakness and still love you and believe in your future. He tolerates you where other people don't understand you. The psalmist declared in Psalm chapter 86 verse 13, For great is thy mercy toward me. Thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest of hell. Your mercy saved me. Your grace formed me. And your word framed me. He sees areas that still need to be conformed and he doesn't hold it against you. What an amazing God. In fact, he declares, in your weakness, my strength is made perfect.
unfortunately not all people had that kind of healthiness in their life so we're not always safe but I am determined to make this house a refuge I am determined that we're gonna be whole and that we're gonna be a hospital and a lighthouse to the community and we're gonna say we're not perfect people but we are the perfect church because we've got a great God who will walk through us with everything and that is not a license to live in a lesser place but it is an invitation to raise to a higher place it's saying no we don't live in a state of compromise but we don't condemn you because of where you've been or what you've done or what you're going through this is a place of refuge God knew how to develop her he knows how to develop us he knows that there's another side to it that you're just one step away and I believe that I believe after October 31st you're gonna see a total new dimension and landscape of life that some things you've struggled with very privately and painfully for a long time you're gonna be freed of in the name of Jesus and whom the Sun sets free and we're gonna seal this deal because I'm gonna get you the word you're gonna have the toolbox but we're also gonna get you the spirit and the anointing which is gonna destroy every yoke over your life and remove every burden so God knew while he was developing her not to let her produce because he knew if you're fruitful when you're bitter you're gonna bring out something contaminated so he had to purge her and purify her and do a heart work first a bitter woman brings a bitter child produces a bitter life God holds some things back not to deny you but to bless you because he knows you've got to go through a certain process before you can handle what he's about to promote you into and there's some blessings that are getting ready to come to your life but God is processing you he's delivering you because no matter what happens when you stand in the position of what God's promised you you're gonna be okay you'll be able to handle it I told you very authentically and vulnerably there's no way I could have come back here two years ago I wasn't ready I couldn't have pastored you because I still had to get some toxicity out I had to deal with some anger I had to deal with some confusion I had to deal with an identity crisis because I thought if this seemed so solid in my life and fell apart was it a lie I had a crisis in every area I had to look under everything and say who am I what am I what do I like what am I gonna be like until I was isolated and it was I didn't know if I had a job or I had a paycheck or I knew I didn't have a husband I didn't know what a family looked like I didn't know if I had health or if I had a ministry I knew I had a call I thought I had a call did I have a call I think I'm chosen by you God and I went through all this kind of stuff and God had to take me and put me in isolation where I could just cry in an altar for one year and purge and cry and discern and learn and get it out and say life won't fair why didn't it happen for me and they say okay you're sovereign you get it and I don't always and not make excuses but just walk in a place of total wholeness and acceptance which to this day y'all be seated I'm almost through to this day watch I, I'm like this I've learned enough that I'm like, I don't just jump back into something and it's not because the thing isn't right it's because I'm not ready come on help me out. I'm not ready. I realize God's doing more so there are some things that there are opportunities that come have come to me and I was like nope I, I, I don't need to take these they've been great opportunities but I'm like I don't need to do that because I need to get to the place where my life and in here I can totally handle so I'm responsible for whatever weight I'm carrying so if I'm gonna have the weight of a relationship I'm gonna have the weight of a ministry that I'm responsible for or a budget or a vision or anything else I want to make sure if I can do it I can do it in wholeness come on I'm not doing it pretentiously help me out Jesus some things are not about everybody else it's about us and when you when you start praying and get to that place she pours out her soul and now and this is what I love she pours out of the bitterness of her soul she not pretending sister Ford she not going all oh, the old out she is on that altar snotting and screaming listen when I was going through hell I remember I wrote in my journals I said God may I have permission to cuss man I started cussing I did I used every word I'd ever heard I think for three days I asked for a week I know that's too hard for some of y'all to handle you're gonna give me a scripture let no evil communication and corruption come out of you I'm gonna give you a scripture back get a truthful prayer I'm gonna give you at least three scriptures for every one you gonna you gonna come down on me with 
So you don't want to get into a theological scripture debate war, please. I'll break that whole religious thing down in Jesus' name. But after a few days, I'm like, this don't really fit me. Now I only cuss occasionally. No, I'm just... That is truth. Because <laughs> sometimes you just all balled up on the inside. Honey, you've got to have a safe place you can deal. I'm safe here. I'm safe to say that here. I'm safe to be me. I'm safe to say I'm going to lead you into truth. We are powerful. We are world changers. We're history makers. But guess what? we got to deal with some stuff. And sometimes you just get all jacked up in life. Disappointed. Depressed. Hurt go through things and she said gets all this infection out like Psalm 51 it's a truthful prayer and she begins to dump and explode gets rid of the toxins the anger and you can't get to real praise that brings power until you get rid of the junk and the garbage and that's where I'm saying okay let the church be the church guys the church didn't be in the church because we should see walk down the streets and we should see people saved and healed and delivered in our shadow. But the reality is I don't have enough power to hardly get myself out of bed. How am I going to change a nation? And so I can't pretend to be something. Listen, you can do it. with. It's not your, and it's not the, this old God and quoting 59 scriptures. Elijah played 63 words and fire fell. It doesn't take all your emotionalism. It might sometimes, if you want to get emotional, do what you want to do. It takes power, real power, a real plug of purity and relationship with God and authenticity that brings forth the true presence of God. And so we got to stop pretending with all these spiritual calisthenics and accolades that all we do is get worked up and sweaty and everything else I want real change I want one person that knows how to really lay their hands on me and you don't have to put on a show you don't have to play the game called church but I just know when you touch me you have a walk with him you have the real deal you know what it is to really hang out in his presence and abide in the secret place of the most high God authentic 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 that's what God's looking for and people want they want the power and the presence and the realness of God and so we've got to get to a place of really connecting of who we are and whose we are and so I'm through with this she starts exploding and Eli the pastor comes and interrupts her I wish I could work that whole thing because some of you start getting your your breakthrough and you get interrupted it's a distraction and the reason you get distracted because they don't have enough spiritual discernment to see a fly they can't they, they, they just and the reason listen the man is so undiscerning that he's like you drunk you intoxicated projection <laughs> it's called look at you because I mean his, his sons are a reflection and projection of, of, of all this that's going on and he's just going through and he's misjudging her now this is where it really gets good because most of us would have quit right there most of us would have said dang man you know what the pastor just said I'm a drunk I'm intoxicated and most of us would have believed it because she, he, she, he was in a spiritual place of authority and, and she had all this distortion and so, so a, a false voice could speak lies into her and it would form her and believe her. Oh God, please don't make me preach right there. And so she believed it. That's why you weigh out every word. Don't you let silly people speak in your life. I'm tired of all this. I'm tired of all this. Paul said, who so easily bewitched you? Let me break some things down. Somebody starts coming to you saying, don't follow her. She's gone through a divorce. She's a woman, something, da, 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 da. Go see Pastor Michael. And I am sincere about that. I'm tired of all these little factions and little places breaking off and getting in because they won't have an overinflated ego and let me have 10 people so I can wear a bishop. Or you ain't no bishop. You're not ordained. You're not a pastor. Sit your butt down until you've gone through some stuff. What is wrong with you? And I'm telling you, stop following the nonsense. I'm serious. It says who so easily bewitched you? Nothing's ever going to be perfect about everything, guys. But this is a good house. It's a solid.
solid house. It's your house. It's God's house. Don't you let somebody take you from your planting of destiny. I don't know who that was for, but it's the truth anyhow. Be seated. And that's the problem. That's why we've got hundreds of thousands of little churches on every corner running 10, 50 people. Not because of God, because of overinflated egos. I promise before the Lord right now, and I'm, I'm almost through. If God said to me, go clean those toilets and be the janitor for the next 30 years of your life, I 